Marxist army chief of staff, and until now, one of the world's more camera-shy presidents. He first achieved notoriety in 1974, when, as a major in the army, he played a leading role in the coup that overthrew the 800-year-old dynasty of Emperor Haile Selassie. Three years later, Mengistu took control of the army and the instruments of government. Observers say many of his political opponents were jailed or murdered, as he embraced a form of Marxism that made him friends and brought him much-needed foreign aid, principally from the Soviet Union. With the new ideology in place and the army in control, Mengistu courted support from other revolutionaries. He found allies in the likes of Fidel Castro and played host to Libya's Colonel Gaddafi. But he needed more than just revolutionary solidarity. With the mounting foreign debt, Mengistu turned to the Soviets for help. In 1978, he signed a treaty of friendship with Leonid Brezhnev, which guaranteed Ethiopia financial and military aid. But with President Gorbachev, everything has changed. He has said he will cut military aid by the end of this year. Mengistu has declared his support for capitalism and democracy. Socialism is being killed off. But a change in political direction has done nothing to bring about peace in the 30-year-old civil war. Money which could be spent on feeding the four million Ethiopians on the brink of starvation is going to the war. The second poorest country in the world spends 65% of its budget on its army. Even greater sacrifices are now being called for. The war is at a turning point and the country's main backer is about to pull out. Since the beginning of this year, the Eritrean separatists in the north have been scoring major victories over Mengistu. But has the high casualty rate and the crippling cost had any effect on him? How long are you willing to send young Ethiopians, the future of this country, to the war in the north to be killed or maimed? In the first place, it is that I wish to send even a single individual to the north. And we don't want the war either. We did not start it. We have inherited the very noble value from our forefathers and that is the national identity of the country. So if there is a challenge against this supreme value, we have no alternative but to defend ourselves. The province of Eritrea stretches along the entire Red Sea coast, and without it, Ethiopia would be landlocked. The key port of Massawa was taken by the rebels in February, a major loss that also marked the end of a nine-month ceasefire. In the fighting that followed, thousands died. The Ethiopian army says 3,000 were killed. The rebels claim 10 times that number. Mengistu says he's not prepared to make any concessions on Ethiopian unity, whatever the price. There is no authority in Ethiopia, no leadership most certainly, which has the mandate to allow the emergence of an independent state carved off from Ethiopia. Whatever they sacrifice, we are ready to pay. Even if it means another 30 years of war? Even if it continues for 100 years. Are we to sign away the fate of our country? Is this generation, which is fully committed to the establishment of a just, democratic and united Ethiopia, to sit over the disintegration of a country whose existence has been defended for millennia against all kinds of regional expansionists and European colonialists. Supposing these rebels manage to capture the city of Asmara and declare independence, well, that does not mean that the war has come to an end. Never. It will never come to an end. If they have this illusion, they are fighting for the unending and interminable extermination of the people.
I travel to Asmara, the Eritrean capital, a garrison town still in government control, but surrounded by enemy troops. 120,000 government troops, almost the entire second army, are stationed here. The field hospital at Asmara bears testimony to the human cost of a war which Mengistu has never allowed television cameras to film. The hospital has 2,000 beds. Most of these troops have gunshot wounds. More serious cases go to another hospital five miles away. I was shown around by the Army's senior surgeon, Brigadier General Gaga Oljo. He's been on the front line for the past seven years. He heads a team of eight doctors and 30 nurses, dealing with 200 casualties a day. This man is typical of the patients here. He was wounded 17 days ago during an offensive to retake Masawa. Like all the men here, he will be sent straight back to the front line when he's recovered. In his case, it will be within three weeks. President Mengistu's second revolutionary army is one of the largest in Africa. It's led by Major General Wubshit Desi. From the day the fighting started, we lost 3,000 dead. You plan to retake Masawa? Oh yes, this is our mission because there is no choice. Without Masawa, it's very difficult even to uh, sustain the unity of the country. The loss of Masawa cut off the vital supply line which brought food aid to the starving in Eritrea and Tigray. Now it's having to be brought in through the much smaller port of Asab. The distances are greater and the journey time has trebled. Tons of food piles up on the docks because there aren't enough lorries to move it. The food corridor through Asab was opened just two months ago and the port is working around the clock to keep supplies flowing. Thanks to good luck more than anything else, it seems that a major famine has been averted this year. Although the rains fell late and the crops failed, food from the west is getting through to famine-hit areas. I travel to Desi in the heart of Ethiopia to watch the food being distributed through both rebel and government-held territory. It takes more than five days for the food to get to Desi by road. Once the food reaches Desse, it's loaded onto trucks run by the Joint Relief Partnership. The partnership is an Ethiopian church group which has been assured safe passage through the war zone. The men sing Be Strong, Work Hard as they load this grain from Britain, part of 200 tons a day donated to Ethiopia by the West. It will be another six days before this truck arrives at its final destination. Abandoned by the Soviets, Mengistu seeks new friends. Top of his list, the Israelis. Both have a common enemy. They believe Arab states are backing the Eritrean rebels. At issue is control of the strategically vital Red Sea. Our relation with Israel is not with the hope that Israel will replace the Soviet Union as an ally of Ethiopia. I do not expect that a treaty of friendship and cooperation between us and the Soviet Union would come to an end. And I do not believe that the government of the Soviet Union will do this. Is Israel helping in the development of your arms industry? 
Our relation with Israel is not a military relationship. And let's not forget, this technology is not exclusive to the Soviet Union and Israel. I mean, you can buy the technology from anywhere as long as you have the money. So where are you buying them from? From the east or the west. We buy the technology from whoever is ready to sell it because it is for defense purposes. These men from the 44 and 46 Brigade are Mengistu's crack troops. The final showdown in the war, which has claimed half a million lives, may be just days away. The rebels are boasting they will soon control Asmara. The government forces must retake Masawa to take the upper hand. And as the fighting escalates, new supplies will be vital. Most of the equipment that we've seen here today is made in the Soviet Union. They have uh, said that this year they will end their agreement to send military and financial aid to Ethiopia. How is that going to affect you? Well, for the present, we have uh, equipment enough to fight. For the future, well, probably this is not my status to answer. <laughs> but it will be a, a severe blow. We're not lying. If it continues, yeah, it's very, very difficult. Back in Addis Ababa, Mengistu is fighting a war on another front to convince the West that his newfound love for capitalism is genuine. Africa's biggest street market is a test bed for capitalism, Mengistu style. Three months ago, the prices of produce from the deeply unpopular collective farms were fixed by the government. Today, government price controls have gone. President Mengistu has promised there will also be major political reforms. Will you allow parties with opposing views to yours to operate freely within the country? Uh, we are party, the Ethiopian People's Democratic Unity Party, and as such, we cannot decide, have no mandate on the making of other parties in our country. If it is in the interest of the unity of the people, there is no reason why other parties should not come to existence in this country. We decide on our future order as a party, and it is not our intention to retain the monopoly of power to be the only party. But it is the people, through the national parliament, Shengo, who will decide whether or not there will be other parties in Ethiopia. But as far as we are concerned, we will be willing to work with other parties here. So perhaps within two years, we could see a multi-party democracy with candidates with opposing views to yours standing for election. Yes, it is quite possible, so long as the national Shengo decides yes. Twelve months ago, opposition to Mengistu was in the form of a military coup. Eleven generals tried to unseat him. Now they're standing trial for their lives. These are the first pictures of their court-martial. Their open and fair trial helps make Mengistu's case to the world that the rule of law, and not the gun, now reigns in Ethiopia. It's alleged that you killed 12,000 people to gain power and retain power. Is that true? Of course, this is absurd. I mean, in the first place, it is not in my nature to kill even an insect or a small living thing, let alone human beings. If anyone perished during the planting of the revolution, it was certainly not on my orders. I did not single out any individual to be killed. This outrages my sense of humanity. How is it imaginable that I ordered the annihilation of 12,000 people? You have very kindly offered to show us the conditions in which political prisoners are kept. Would you extend that invitation to representatives of Amnesty International? 
who have invited them in the past. They have come and visited our prison system, and I renew this invitation any time. We have nothing to hide. The country's most famous political prisoners now live modestly on the outskirts of Addis Ababa. These 11 members of Haile Selassie's royal dynasty have served a total of 152 years in Mengistu's jails. They've been released over the past 24 months, but are still not allowed to travel abroad. Could each of you just tell me how long you've been in prison? 15 years. 14 years. 14 years. 14 years. 14 years. 15 years. For 14 years. 14 years. For nine years. For 15 years. 14 years. 78-year-old Princess Tanana Warg is Haile Selassie's daughter. Uh, we were taken from our house and taken to another house in the name of Ethiopia and Tutkam. We were put under house arrest. You spent 14 years in prison. Were you ever brought before a court? No. No, no. Uh, oh. No, during that time, we were never brought before a court. Where did you spend those 14 years? At the beginning, we were under house arrest, and then we were taken to the central prison. 33-year-old Prince Betty Makone has been in jail since he was 18. Were you treated well? Well, in a way. Were you with uh, any other prisoners apart from your family? Yeah, there were prisoners in Alambakai. Mm. And were you able to associate with them? Yeah, in fact, they were sympathetic. Mm. Were they treated well, do you know? Well. Were you ever fearful for your life? Well, initially, yes. You thought you were going to die? Yeah. I cannot deny that. That was unfortunate. During the revolution, without knowledge, has happened many things which uh, are not really uh, can make us happy. This is not peculiar for all Ethiopia. This happened through centuries in many countries. I can mention many. But it's one-time phenomena. I invite everyone to come and see the true nature of this country and what's going on around. That can be the only instrument to know about us or to trust us. The problem is not the leadership or our brutality. The problem is lack of peace. The all-important test for Mengistu should be his willingness to open negotiations to end the civil war. Without such a move, Mengistu's appeal to the West for help is likely to fall on deaf ears. <laughs> of the Cold War has raised the hope that local conflicts can be resolved. But in the Horn of Africa, the Soviet withdrawal has done nothing to dampen its vicious indigenous struggles. Catastrophic wars are tearing apart Sudan, Ethiopia and Somalia. There are more than two million refugees in the region, and in Ethiopia, some four million people are on the brink of famine once again. An urgent international conference in Cairo was convened this week behind closed doors to discuss the crisis in the Horn. Richard Dowden, Africa editor of the Independent newspaper, was among the delegates. He reports now for The World This Week from Cairo and Addis Ababa. The capital of Ethiopia hardly looks like the heart of a country mutilated by war and famine. Addis Ababa carries on as if the whole country were peaceful and prosperous. Ethiopians are used to keeping going in the worst of times. The 
government maintains this illusion of normality. It tells the people nothing about the famine which this year again threatens millions with starvation, and not much more about the civil war, which has already cost hundreds of thousands of lives. But now the front line is less than a hundred miles away, and further north in Eritrea, the final battle in the war for independence is about to be fought. The Eritrean People's Liberation Front has driven the Ethiopian army out of the whole province, except for a small enclave around Asmara, the regional capital. In February, the rebels seized the port of Basawa, cutting off Asmara. Unless President Mengistu can mount a rescue operation soon, Asmara will fall, and the rebels will have the whole province in their hands. Ethiopia could be about to break up. In Cairo this week, an international conference met to discuss the crisis in the Horn of Africa, and in particular, the catastrophe in Ethiopia. Organized by Britain's International Institute for Strategic Studies and its Egyptian counterpart, the conference brought together diplomats, scholars and experts to discuss what can be done about the wars which are tearing the region apart. British Thank you very much. That's Thank you so much. Thank you. Representatives from the United States, the Soviet Union, France and Britain sat down with Egyptians, Somalis, Sudanese and Ethiopians to ask why, despite superpower detente, these wars have erupted so dramatically. Retired from the Egyptian army in 1986. He was involved in the 67, 56, 67 and 73 wars. <laughs> As Egyptian, and this is my own view, we are looking forward for the, uh, our national security. One of the important issues in our national security is the security of the Red Sea. And this is why we are looking forward to solve the problem in the area peacefully. We don't want to be involved in war. For the past 16 years, President Mengistu Haile Mariam has ruled Ethiopia with the backing of the Soviet Union. The Americans say the Russians have pumped over five billion dollars worth of arms into Ethiopia. One of the puzzles certainly is that they've got rid of people like Ceausescu and Honecker and uh, Zhivkov. Why do they put up with Mengistu? But there's no substitute for Mengistu. If Mengistu's out, the whole system falls apart. Both superpowers sought allies in the region to give them military bases to back up their operations in the Middle East and in the Indian Ocean. To match Soviet bases on the Dalek Islands off Ethiopia, the United States supported President Siad Barre in Somalia to obtain facilities at Berbera on Somalia's northern coast. In exchange for the bases, Ethiopia took both guns and ideology from the Soviet Union, and its government adopted the Soviet model to try and develop the country. <laughs> When the Russians began to abandon Ethiopia, the Ethiopians immediately abandoned Marxism. In March this year, President Mengistu announced the ending of the one-party socialist state and a return to the free market economy. In Addis Ababa, a statue of Karl Marx had paint thrown over it, until recently a sacrilege, but now no one has even bothered to clean it. Red stars and slogans proclaiming proletarian internationalism have been painted over by the government. Only Lenin survives, but they say here he's striding away from Ethiopia. As the Russians pulled out, a new ally moved in. In January this year, Israel re-established its embassy in Addis Ababa after a break of 17 years. The relationship between Ethiopia and Israel goes back a long way. In Ethiopia, the story goes that the Queen of Sheba came from Ethiopia and traveled to Israel to meet King Solomon. She became pregnant by him and their son was the first in the dynasty of monarchs which was to last until the Emperor Haile Selassie was deposed in 1974. Whatever the truth behind this myth, there are a group of Ethiopians who still follow Judaism, known in Ethiopia as the Falashas. The Israelis are offering to give them a home in Israel, and recently thousands of them have turned up at the Israeli embassy
to seek a passage to their new homeland. Under the new alliance between Ethiopia and Israel, they're allowed to emigrate. Many people have said that one of the uh, objectives in the re-establishment of relations is to uh, send a flood of militias to Israel. I can assure you this is not our policy. But this new relationship is not merely the sentimental renewal of a 3,000-year-old love affair. Both Ethiopia and Israel feel surrounded by the same enemies, the Muslim states. Recently, President Mengistu described Ethiopia as an island of Christianity surrounded by Muslims. And according to the Ethiopians, the Arab Muslim states are supporting the Eritrean rebels in their bid to split away from Ethiopia. We have evidence that um, a number of Afri uh, Arab countries are supplying very sophisticated equipment to the rebels. Uh, are you prepared to name them? Well, uh, I think we're, we're trying to, as I, as I told you before, we're trying to tell them that this is wrong. We're trying to create good neighborly relations with them. And uh, they know who they are, and uh, I can assure you we know some of them, so let us leave it at that. I think that the main backers are uh, financially the Libyans and selling the hardware, military hardware, especially the Iraqis. And this is coming through uh, Port Sudan in Sudan and through Sudan into Eritrea. The Israelis accuse the Arab states, in particular Libya and Iraq, of supplying guns to the rebel movements in Eritrea and Tigray. The Arab states accuse the Israelis of taking over the Dalak Island bases from the Russians and sending advisors and weapons, including cluster bombs, to Ethiopia. We know that the Israelis are giving help in military field to Ethiopians uh, to counter the revolution parts in Eritrea. And this is why they are uh, making so to, to be in the Red Sea. Because if Eritrea, as I said, have their independence, the Israelis will not be in the Red Sea. What sort of military assistance are they giving? I yeah. think arms and, and these uh, bombs which they get the license to do. With cluster yeah. bombs. Yeah. 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 We haven't been supplying cluster bombs to Ethiopia. Mm -hmm. If they have any cluster bombs, we think that they can buy it on the world market from countries which are producing such bombs. What about other sorts of weapons? Well, we have been supplying a small quantity of light weapons, and that's all. What about the suggestion that Arab states are providing help for the Eritreans? Do you think that's true? Uh, not, not a lot of them are giving uh, help. And if they are giving help, it will not be compared by the help given by the Israelis to Ethiopia or by Soviet Union or by United States to Ethiopia itself. It will not be compared like that. We don't have any Israeli advisor, military advisors or otherwise in Ethiopia. We don't have any military bases in Ethiopia. We've been following with great interest what the Arab propaganda machine, or machinery has been trying to impress on Arab countries, other Arab countries, or even the world, as if there was some kind of a deal which was struck between Ethiopia and Israel, and that's why they tried to explain why Ethiopia renewed relations. Israeli would come and help them militarily because of difficult military situation, and the Ethiopians would sell, as the Arabs put it, the Ethiopian Jews, the Falashas completely unfounded, and completely untrue. But the Israelis are not just helping out a natural ally against a common Arab enemy. At stake for them is the Red Sea coast. If Eritrea becomes independent, Ethiopia will lose control of its ports, Asab and Masawa. The Eritreans are divided about half and half between Muslim and Christian, but Israel fears that an independent Eritrea could be dominated by its Arab backers. In Israeli eyes, the whole of the Red Sea coast would then be controlled by the Arabs, and Israel's only outlet to the eastern seas at Eilat could be blocked. We would be, I think, upset if this coast would uh, come under some kind of Arab control, which might be the case if Eritrea should be independent. And then we think that the Arabs who are supplying and helping the Eritrea Liberation Front would come and ask for the political price, meaning that this part of Ethiopia would be independent and be part of the Arab and Muslim world. But to help Ethiopia remain united, the Israelis have to support President Mengistu, 
one of the most ruthless rulers in Africa, and now one of the most unpopular. The best way I can explain what the Israelis have done in Ethiopia is adventurism. I think adventurous uh, or adventure-seeking elements in the Israeli government uh, have uh, been responsible for this uh, caper in Ethiopia. I think they miscalculated very seriously. Uh, there's nothing sillier than to uh, rush to support a leader who's practically fallen of his own ineptitude. And uh, the Israelis have probably postponed the fall of Mengistu by six months, but I think that's about all they could possibly do. Have the Israelis back to tyrant who's about to be overthrown. If all the military resources at the Russians' disposal could not win Mengistu's struggle to hold Ethiopia together, what hope have the Israelis? If Asmara falls, so will Mengistu. But no one in Ethiopia, apart from the Eritreans, wants an independent Eritrea. Neither do either of the superpowers. Mengistu may be unpopular, but he has been so absolute in his suppression of dissent that there is no alternative ruler who could hold the country together. After Mengistu, Ethiopia may implode into anarchy. A report from Richard Dowden. The civil war looks to be reaching a climax as rebel forces lay siege to the last government-held city in Eritrea. The EPLF knows the war has reached a critical point. Right now they are preparing for what they believe will be the last great battle, the capture of the capital, Asmara. The city is already surrounded, almost under siege. It will be a massive battle, with very high stakes for the civilian population. The people of Asmara are not prepared for the war. They haven't been touched directly by the fighting. And for a city the size of Asmara, if it suffers the same fate as Masawa, it would be a huge massacre. And I don't think the central government can handle it anymore. Unless and otherwise they start a negotiation very soon. Peacefully if they want to settle it. Do you think there's a will for that? Uh, I think they have no other alternative now. The war is almost being over now. What I think is in Asmara, I don't think that they can last even another two, two three months. I think. Because uh, how could they get the supply? Supply from the air. They cannot, even big army like U.S., United States cannot afford. So I think it's almost on the verge of collapse. On an Ethiopian military base, we saw a solitary tree. As we approach, we discover several ammunition boxes under the tree. And in those boxes, there were hundreds of skulls and bones. We could tell by the boots that they must have been Ethiopian soldiers. And it was so strange in the middle of this drought area, under this tree, which normally is a symbol of life, to find all this death, all this culture of death. and dusk is falling. The planes will not return until daybreak. After another day of waiting, Masawa comes to life. At night, the city truly belongs to the Eritreans.
Well, the Eritreans are remarkably resilient. I guess they have been hardened by 28 years of war. At night in Massawa, life goes on. Markets open, people move around, go to work. And you would almost believe that it is a normal life, except that they are forced to make their night their day. Almost everyone now in Massawa depends on food aid. So distribution is being organized. But it is a very fragile lifeline. You can't depend on food aid forever. And the Eritreans don't want to be beggars. They want to recover from the famine. They want to develop their country. And I'm afraid they won't be able to do it if the war goes on. <laughs> I just want to tell Ethiopian government to stop the war as soon as possible and let the delivery of this uh, for the poor, the donation, should reach in time because four million people are suffering just for nothing. This has to be taken immediate action and I think there should be pressure from those powers from outside, having great powers like United States, uh, Soviet Union and the other powers, they should press the Ethiopian government so that there should be peace because we are just suffering for nothing. 20, 80 years they are fighting for this miserable life and we don't know the reason and I don't know the reason why I was fighting. They are skeptical and fear for the future. I'm afraid even worse things will happen. of Masawa is a major victory. Uh, but at the same time, when you see as a destruction of the town, you have this mixed feeling that the liberty is so expensive that you have to pay, to pay so much to get it. I think the idea of being free is more expensive than anything else. So, with the present uh,